Now, are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then we'll begin. the uh, cast iron tops a bit of a soaking with some pb blaster which is my preferred version of wd-40 left it overnight for 20 around right about 24 hours and then took the whole thing apart i took thousands of photographs of every step as much as i could i safely say i needed to have taken more photographs when it came to putting that lot together again if you haven't got any wire wall kitchen floor will do pretty much the same job and uh, it's really handy actually for getting down into those grooves and cleaning those up. I think it does a slightly better job than my wall to be quite honest with you, but you can't really beat a black brush from a drill. Sin strip paint stripper. Again, this took the paint off really easily. It was one coat, leave it for 15 minutes, the wire brush in it. <laughs> that was flying everywhere, so keep your sleeves down and yeah, it's getting in my face and everything. Like my face was on fire. And it, <laughs> to be honest with you, the whole cleaning process, getting everything back to bare metal, took well over seven days to do. But I was going to a, a lot more length than I imagine most people would do, including cleaning every single bolt, washer, screw, you name it. After the paint stripper though, it was, you know, you got to head to, to uh, the jet washer and jet wash this shirt off and neutralize it of course you know what happens when water hits metal almost immediately goes rusty colored so everything is what you're seeing me doing there with the wire wall attachment in the drill you have to do all over again to get rid of the rust and then it's just a case of shooting some etch primer a uh, couple of thin coats of that there was some parts of the casting i wasn't overly happy with so i got out the file and smoothed it off a little bit more they just look a bit nicer, that's all. It has to be said, hammer type paint. It looks like it's been hit with a ball hammer type finish. Almost three dimensional looking, it's certainly not flat. It isn't easy to paint and it certainly doesn't work out very well if you use a brush. I found spraying it was definitely the better option and can hose it on. The first coat I do, I always do a light dusting anyway. Um, I knocked this up pretty much with just 10% thinners. This isn't hammerite paint, so I use normal thinners not hammerite thinners don't don't use hammerite thinners unless you're using hammerite because it's it's like an oil based it, it won't mix and you lose a lot of paint yeah so 10 percent thinners and i'm just smashing this on i think full fan two and a half tones out on flow i'm trying to remember now but it's kind of bizarre this paint dries really quickly so you really can just can hose the damn stuff on and it actually benefits you because the more you hose it on the more you get this effect and it's but it's difficult to get it over a wide space and not have what i would call train lines so um it's a kind of softly softly catchy monkey when spraying this paint what really made me skeptical about this was the fact that i'm spraying using a spray finish on a workshop tool which we all know that what is each layer of a spray finish a micro and a couple of micro whatever it's so damn bloody thin it's really not going to take much to chip it and make it look ugly real fast i did put four coats of paint on this and i still felt it was too thin and i did you'll see in the video i did accidentally tap it with a hammer and uh, the, the, it just fell off a little bit of paint which is pain because touching up isn't that easy nonetheless i will and you won't notice it unless you're literally looking for it but color match is pretty much spot on i took my color from a part of the fence that had been painted in this what i can only describe as mint green 
or Hulk Green. The part in the fence had never seen sunlight, so it, for me that was the best option to take my swatch from and try and get the best match, which I did, and there we go. It wasn't a bad finish, but if you look closely, there's a difference in the texture, just slightly, which is what I meant earlier by tram lines. The thing that really struck me and made me fall in, in love with this saw even more, I know it sounds ridiculous me talking about falling in love with the tool, given the current climate of things where companies don't actually want us to repair anything and to rent, not buy, not own, that kind of shite. There's nothing on this saw, oh, okay, albeit it's in Imperial, so it's a bit of a prick to buy the bolts. I have to specially order them and they can take a while to get hold of them. But it's nice just to know that that one hunt, that whole saw, I don't need to really worry about anything about it. The belts go, I can get them off Amazon for the next day. I don't need to send any part of that machinery off to Bosch, the wall, for them to fix it and then obviously get hit with a fucking great big bill. If you can get your hands on a saw like this, it's the end of your worries, really, when it comes to the maintenance of any tool in the workshop. Jog on. Yeah, I painted everything inside and out. You name it, both sides. Every single nut, bolt, screw, always cleaned up, even washers, you name it, pretty much like this. Very time consuming, really boring, but uh, you know, at the end, seeing it all nice and cleaned up and looking almost as good as new was worth it. Was, 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 it was worth it to me anyway. I think it was pretty good. Here's just some reference shots of all the bits you'll have in your cup that you took out of that piece prior. So you know where they go and what they look like. Assembling this part makes more sense if I show it outside of trying to do it inside this, the cabinet of the saw. It's much more difficult that way. And this will hopefully make more sense. Funnily enough, I did actually manage to pull out this whole piece without having to take it apart to get it out of the saw, but for some reason it wouldn't go back in. The part that I hammered in, now if I'd hammered, it, hammered that in and just clocked it 90 degrees and, and put all this together, it would have gone into the cabinet absolutely fine. I didn't think of that at the time. I mean, like you, like me, this is my first time assembling it. This is one part of the saw. My saw was missing somehow, it was damaged. And uh, it came like this. I picked it up. It's, nevertheless, it's a bit, it's a hack that worked and uh, keeps that aligned, that rise and fall mechanism going up and down. The 
nuts and bolts uh, are torqued down to about <coughs> Newton meters. Um, I don't have any torque settings, so. and your hands are too cold to get things comfortable. This is definitely one of them. <coughs> Newton meters. <coughs> Pound foot talk, Billy Bob. This whole bracket here, the 113, it seems to be its sole purpose is the uh, riving knife bracket, which holds the riving knife. So when you rise and fall the blade, it follows with the blade. I think this saw was a 1965 saw. I think the riving knife I've got, it wasn't made for this year's saw. meters and there he is in the wild buffing his door handle his hand a blur That's JDM heaven right there. This is why I like it when it rains because I can see the beading on my car from this wax. I use this on all my cast iron tops and I have not had a problem with any finish. Let's face it, whatever you do, when you're running a piece of wood for a machine, you're going to be sanding it anyway. So it doesn't really matter what wax you use on your machines. This is just quite, I find it harder wearing, lasts a bit longer than any of the uh, gear you buy from the shops that say it's for machines. I don't think it's anywhere near as good. I didn't film any of me wiring this whole thing back together for good reason. Um, I don't want anyone to come to harm from following my lack of electricity know-how. Me and electricity do not get on. I'm, I'm very prone to uh, cutting through live electric cables and being chucked across the room. I don't like working with something you can't see. <laughs> Saws, these Bodkin saws, or saws of probably that era, none of them came with uh, dust extraction. So I need to address that. And I'm going to start with the under dust extraction. And as you can see, there's not a lot of room for activities. This saw's arbor tilts towards the rip fence, which isn't great. I mean, if you're cutting 40, 45 degree cut and it trapped between blade and the rip fence, that's not clever. I'm going to change how the rail's fixed to this top blade to address that. If you're wondering what all that banging and cracking was that's the starter capacitor i've managed to smash anyway i'm hoping to build something around that blade underneath the table top that keeps the suction just about right and um, hopefully there's less dust coming up through firing in my face at the top of the saw you often hear in facebook groups people complaining that dust extraction hoses and outlets etc yeah they're all different shapes and sizes this is one occasion which i can't believe actually worked i'm just going through the crap i've got in a box once upon a time i thought i could use some guttering to make some dust extraction and uh, it didn't work out for some reason but nonetheless i found that uh, the hose that connects all to this actually fits perfectly without me thinking about so grab your nuts grab a beer and here we go
I used uh, Millie put, if that's how you pronounce it, uh, kicking around to try and... I'm going to call it porting. It's like what you do on a, a um, RX-7 with the exhaust and stuff. Basically, just to help keep airflow nice and smooth. No 90-degree bends and, and with as least resistance as possible. I will, I will um, be testing this as well with a proper airflow meter. The weight of everything was an issue as well. I think the motor is bearing down on some cog gears or whatever you want to call them, um, weighing in about 25 kilos or something. Because of that capacitor problem, I had actually had to buy a bloody brand new motor, which is actually only 16 kilograms, which is even better. And I've gone for a three horsepower motor, not a one and a half horsepower motor. All I'm thinking here is basically that blade is going to fire off dust in two parts. One when it comes underneath the board and goes through the board and, and throw all the dust in my face. And the next cut is when the teeth go back through the board into the, towards the bottom of the table saw. by Semyon Kosberg, who developed RD0XXX series. I find aluminium tape the best for dust extraction because it sticks like shit to a blanket. It doesn't matter how much air it gets pulled through and the dust in the air that gets pulled past that tape. That stuff doesn't want to come back off again. It's a real prick to get back off again if you need to get it off again. But unlike, um, say, gaffer tape, which just slowly undoes itself with the air that's coming through the tape and the dust eventually falling off, this doesn't do that, this tape. Way, way better than duct tape. But there is one more thing. Room, that is. For more activities, I still felt I could improve on that. With that tilting like it does up to the top, there's a massive space. So I thought, how much more can I seal this off? Probably more time went into actually thinking about every scenario, moving, tilting, you name it. Probably took more time than actually building this dust collection part. I made one very good ply throat plate template and then used that as a pattern to uh, cut like three, four and more.
Have a guess how much uh, you think the new aluminium throat plate is for this saw. We still make some parts for this saw. 300 pounds. <laughs> yeah, all right, job on. Oh yeah, I got lucky there, right? Eh? That's nearly on point. Nice. With the blade fully lowered, the top of the blade basically sits below the line of the throat plate. Um, so you can't actually have, to, the blade's not low enough basically to not touch the underneath of that throat plate. Put the throat plate in, wind the saw, level up. So the blade goes through the throat plate, creating your zero clearance insert. Bit of pain. Thread in this arbor is reverse thread. So it isn't righty tighty, lefty loosey. It's lefty righty, loosey tighty. Um, so yeah, it's going to be very easy to drop that nut down there with the cast iron top on top. That's going to be a fucking prick to get back. Or it's going to go down the pipe into the pipe. As long as the dust extraction isn't on, it's going to be retrievable. So the idea is I can take off that attachment and attach it to any throat plate I like. I'm not taking credit for uh, this. This I got from a channel called Hooked on Wood. I think it's a German guy. And it kind of all made sense. But there are discrepancies in my setup to his, so it's quite difficult to kind of um, gauge with how well this works compared with his. How his setup works looks beautiful. How mine is is very different. Uh, and I'm still playing with the idea, I'm still trying to work it out. And this just landed. Nice and red. And onto the fence. Well, the construction of that, the little marker. So, you know, when you're sliding up and down, you scale on the rails. So if it's like one one inch cut you want to make, like that little point of one inch cut, which is a pain for me because I'm used to working in metric on the rails on this saw are in Imperial. And I've got a little plan to try and get around that. This dawned on me today. Do you remember the expression, I'll tap that? Oh, finally figured out what the they actually meant today. Needless to say, this is my first time tapping a hole. It's a good day when you learn something new, eh? It's important you get this installed in the correct direction with that grub screw and the slot facing away from the handle to clamps the whole thing down. If you don't get the bulge of that part and also the grub screw facing the correct direction, you've got no chance of getting a screwdriver in there because the handle's in the way. And this that's part of the uh, how you do all the adjustments in a minute, which I'll show you now. Here's a quick little uh, view of the piston that does the work. To fix how much clamping pressure is forced when you pull that handle down, if it's too loose, this is what you need to do. Remove that grub bolt with that kind of funny nipple. Remove that piston. You probably need to use the handle to push it out a little bit so you can get your fat fingers around it and pull it out. That will review, reveal sorry, the slotted screw that you can turn in and out and give more pressure or less pressure. And this is how that locking grub screw works with that piston. Pretty straightforward, really. Quite, quite clever engineering, I think. There you go. This was an utter dickhead to do, and I easily spent the best part of the day racking my brains how the hell this goes together, because there's no instructions online and no one's sharing that kind of information. But that rod is loaded with two springs, one at one end and one at the other end, and there's only one of me. So this is what I come up with in the end to push the rod far enough down 
because obviously you can't get inside that piece of fence and um, try and attach which I can only explain as like a locking nut type of device which also puts tension on the spring and it was an absolute pig to do as, as well as if, if you don't get it right and it part that you see me screwing at the moment that drops inside that fence rail you got to take the whole thing apart to get it back out again it was a right pain in the ass that's how i did it eventually anyway i mean it took me the best part of the day to get that far something so old i can actually turn the saw with it now it's pretty simple to correct the fence and align it align it with your miter slot you just need to loosen these bolts slide it up to the miter slot and just tap it until it's perfectly straight and just tighten up your nuts when you've done this and you're sliding it backwards and forwards and you find when you clamp it down again it's still on the piss it's probably because of the rails that the fence is sliding on aren't parallel check those and you probably need to shim them you know, use some paper beer can whatever and uh, get that sorted to de-rust those lovely rails you you just saw there i use this vapo rust stuff that had been recommended to me by my brother i wasn't overly uh, enamored with it albeit it cleaned out all the rust proper did a good job but man did it take a lot of polishing up to get it to a uh, reasonable standard not a standard that i was actually happy with either i would really have liked you know my sort of chrome shiny but there you go and then there's this little micro adjuster the, what, the one on this saw is a little bit knackered i'm guessing someone had uh, you know slid over the fence with it still engaged and smashed those cogs pretty badly i'm hoping i can possibly get it to usable without having to pay 126 quid for a replacement people that supply the parts are a joke for prices for these things to get that fine adjuster out of the uh, rip fence just hit on the uh, cog end and it'll come out pretty easily all this little bit of work here trying to straighten out those cogs it did work out kinda i will be buying a new one it will do for now anyway it got me thinking yeah for that price i need to somehow i need to think of something that's going to stop this from happening again and uh, this was my uh, idea of how to stop it i had this piece of junk kicking around in a drawer absolutely useless as tits on a ball I needed a spring. I didn't have the bits or mindset to know how to make spring. So I tore this thing apart. Honestly, it's a pile of shit anyway. So uh, that, that pile of shit actually served a good purpose in its life. And it's pretty straightforward obviously it disengages the spring disengages the cog and keeps it out of the way when i need to slide that fence because we're all absent-minded at some point and we're going to slide that fence across not thinking to pull that cog out of the way aren't we two sets of rails that come with this saw there's some short ones and some long ones my problem with this saw is and the only problem i've got with this saw is is the arbor tilts towards the fence i always have my fence to the right of me so any enthusiast is going to think oh no that no, you've set this up wrong well i haven't actually so i've moved the rails over to the left which gives me quite a nice capacity for 45 degree cuts My saw came with a riving knife bracket that enables the riving knife to raise and lower with the arbor. But it didn't come with what I needed to attach the riving knife to the bracket with though, unfortunately. So I uh, hacked this together. The riving knife that came with this saw, it's a whopper. It's a beast. It's gigantic. It's enough to make a horse cry. I, I don't need a riving knife that is higher than the top of the curve of that blade. I'm not sure what this means. Maybe it's Klingon for six, seven thirds or some other fraction. Anyway, I need to use this plate because that little bit of thickness just puts that riving knife in the perfect position in the middle of the kerf of my blade. Come on, guys. I'm puckered up and ready to go. I can't wait for your comments on this. Yes, I know that's the original riving knife. But man, this is damn so easier than any other solution I had in mind. Sorry. But there you go.
But before we use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. I can chase quick.